Thank you. It's my honor to be here. In the last few years, I've experienced the death of my parents. Something you're never prepared for, but it's something that does happen. During this time, I spent a considerable amount of time with a nearby community, with medical professionals, with hospitals, with hospice organizations, and a variety of people that touched the lives of my parents and myself. This is probably where I should show a picture of my parents, but if I did that, you wouldn't hear another word. I'm here to talk about continuous improvement, process improvement, and what it can do. And most importantly, what you can do to make a difference. Everyone I know, including companies and individuals, are trying to transform something. In our Hackett research, our data shows that 68% of organizations have in their plans, in their two to three year plans, significant, if not moderate, transformations. Reminds me of New Year's resolutions. This is the year, right? Am I alone? This is the year. I'm going to finally do it. Well, let me tell you about big change. Big change, and the data supports this for decades, big changes fail. Now, how you justify and quantify and research what that really means, is it the timelines? Is it the rewards that you wanted? My contention to you is that it's important to look at small changes. Well, my parents spent various time in the hospitals, it was easy for us sisters to get together and complain, something I hate to do. It's just not productive. We started a list of what was the time zones. What was the time if you pushed the button and you heard the phrase, we'll be there immediately. Immediately, we coded as 14 to 28 minutes. We'll be there in a minute. Minutes, we learned, were 19 to 32 minutes. I'll send someone right down was really ambiguous. What we decided to do, though, because of my background in process improvement, which my, my siblings always tell me, oh, not again, process improvement, is to really look at the process. And what could we do to make it better for the patients, to make it better for our family, and most importantly, I think, in our hearts, we all want to be of service to others. How could we make this experience better for others? We developed lists and ideas. We tried to take the emotion out of it, but we captured what we thought would be good process improvements. Continuous improvement can make dramatic change in your life and in your organizations. What I want to do is just give you three quick concepts. So if this is something that makes sense to you, I'd like you to do a couple of things. First of all, if there's a challenge in your life that you're working on, instead of thinking of it as a problem, thinking of it as a process that could be improved. If, for example, you're trying to improve your health, as I think everybody is, maybe you'd like to incorporate more water in your daily activities. What would be an easy strategy would be to have glasses available, have bottled water. There's even some here. I like to have a mug that has my children's pictures on it so I can realize this is why I'm focused on adding more water in my daily life. What most organizations and people are trying to do, though, is to streamline a process to make it better. And how that works best is if you focus and think about the process involved. In continuous improvement, there's a term called Kaizen, which is a Japanese term to really focus. Focus on the process. What's working well, and where could it be improved? 
when I worked at Pfizer, we were trying to find a way to remove one day out of the financial close. What that means in the accounting world is you close the books, you turn off the general ledger, and then you do what you have to do to adjust the records and make the reports available. Two to three days is a best practice. We were not at two to three days. So what we did is we got a group of people together. Some people call them SMEs, subject matter experts. And we did what I call the 69 cent post-it note exercise. Over 90% of process improvement is done by process mapping. And all that means is identifying the steps in a process and looking to the value that they add. Are they important? If they are, who says? Have things changed? So we had our subject matter experts in a room. We put our post-it notes on the wall. And we said, let's go back and check with people and see if this is still important. We came back about a week later. Hard to believe. One of the biggest steps that we were doing, we thought we were doing for our customers, the businesses. When we asked the businesses what value they got from that, they all said the same thing. We thought you were doing it because you had to. I call that the company salute. <laughs> Nobody knows. Everybody thinks it's done for the other person. We literally took one day out of the financial close. Now, if you were an accountant or a finance executive, you'd be real happy when I said that. It's a big deal. OK, focus on the situation. Another thing I'd like to suggest is make it easy. As you're looking to continually improve, make it easy for people to do the right thing. Have you ever walked up to a door with a big gripping handle and seen a sign that says push? Fortunately, I've already checked the doors here. We're OK. But I have seen that. I have pulled handles that you have to push. Make it easy to do the right thing. If you want people to push, take the handle off. <laughs> it works. And believe it or not, you can do the same thing in other activities. I had a boss once who couldn't type. So I somehow quickly thought, if I want an answer, I want short and sweet. Two or three mouse taps, right? Click, click, yes or no. So I positioned my emails as such. Would it be da 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 da, yes or no? All he had to do was two or three clicks. Make it easy. The way I like to look at make it easy is what's natural. What is natural in the process flow? Some people call this the voice of the customer. If you are accepting information or people are coming to you for something, the best thing you can do is get in their shoes. What we did at Pfizer was I would send my staff out to be in the position of the person asking for what we provided. It did a couple of things, too. It helped them realize that we cared about them, and it helped my staff understand what was important to our customers. Magical things happen when we realized how to our customers some of these things were just so Strange. There are organizations now that have huge customer satisfaction surveys in place. I am a wonderful person to always answer those. Tell people what's wrong. Help them make it better. You're doing them a favor. I reframed complaints to my staff. I made little signs, kind of like bumper stickers, and I said, complaints are gifts, though you may not like how they're wrapped. <laughs> Because otherwise, you just hear these things as complaints. And really, your customers or whoever is kind of telling you how you can make your process better. Don't take it personally. You can make it better. 
And then the last thing that has always worked well for me is to just take action. You know how they say if you have to do something, you have to eat two frogs, eat the ugliest one first? You just have to do things. With the situation in the medical community, we tried to take the emotion out of it, but we stepped up. We, we made our list of ideas. We knocked on doors. Some of the groups we worked with actually had continuous improvement experts or departments that were willing to listen to us. Have you ever been to your doctor's office and had to fill out three separate forms that have 80% of the same information on each form? Of course, if your doctor's a kind of a relationship person, when you go in, the doctor just talks to you. Anyhow, they don't look at the form. Would you be out of your comfort zone if you suggested that maybe while you're waiting, you could identify the duplications so that the next time they updated that form, maybe they could make a, a correction? Would that make you feel bad? Would you suggest that you could make them a PDF fillable form, they could email you before you came? <laughs> <laughs> then they could read your writing. And you would have it done and maybe you wouldn't have to wait so long. I love to do that, PDF fillable forms. I mean, it's not that hard, make it easy. Do something. I moved to a condo area and one of my nieces was coming to see me. So I gave her directions. This is before she had GPS on her phone, whatever. So I, I live one mile east of Sprinkle Road on H Avenue. Didn't know the change took place, but this magic corner of H Avenue and Sprinkle Road, where I, in fact, got my only ticket of my life because I was in a severe car accident, had a wonderful new sign that said E space H Avenue. They had put the direction E. Now, if you're from Kalamazoo, you know we have a lot of two-digit cities or roads, right? CD. Yeah, well, guess what? It goes all the way out to VW, right? Well, being from Grand Rapids, my niece didn't know that. So she clearly went through G Avenue, which didn't have an E, whizzed right by EH, on and on, and finally got to my house anyhow by some retracking. Now, I learned from that because the next person that I would tell how to get to my home, I certainly would explain the flaws in that sign. And I'm sure my niece would not do this wrong the next time. However, you know, we all have this need to serve, right? It's one of our foundational things, to provide service to the next person. I thought, you know what, I bet I could make that better. So I called the road commission and I, I said, I noticed you've got a new lovely sign, it's lighted up at night. However, it's E space H. Every other sign down that whole road and the streets before don't have the directions. Would it be possible to change that sign and just say H Avenue? Well, that would be very expensive. I was so committed, I said I would be willing to pay. <laughs> well, he didn't have an answer for that because no one's, <laughs> who would do that? You know, this continuous improvement, it kind of gets in you. Let me see what I can do, he said. So I called back in a couple of months because nothing had happened. And he said, oh yeah, you're the sign lady. I said, yeah, mm -hmm, okay. <laughs> And I said, well, you know, I, I, I still see it. It hasn't changed or anything. And I gave him a couple of suggestions. Make it easy for him to do what I wanted. Let me see what I can do. About a week later, I went by. And there I saw E period H <laughs> Avenue. He had painted a dot. <laughs> I was so excited. I called my friend. She wasn't home. I left a message. Judy, Judy, I got my period on H Avenue. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Her husband said, honey, I think this one's for you. And my last quick story, if I may, because continuous improvement does work, is at work, 
We had done this nice project, this wonderful proposal. We had packaged it up. We knew we had a good thing. And since I'm kind of the leader of the group, I was going to go to important person number one and get permission. Important person number one said, you know, that's a, that's a good idea. I like that idea, but I'm not going to give you the big hammer because I've got bigger fish to fry. So I went to important person number two, you know, pick a person. Important person number two was busy or whatever. By the time I got to important person number three, my balloon was starting to fizzle. And I did what any intellectual woman of my age would do. I called my mother. <laughs> and my mother said, you know, Penny, if no one's in charge, I guess you are. If no one's in charge, I guess you are. Do you mean I could make that change? I did. You have more power than you know. Small changes are powerful. We're all on a journey in our personal and professional life. I suggest to you that continuous improvement is research-based, practical, and kind of a fun way to approach life. And in case you didn't catch it, the acronym I gave you was TED. <laughs> Think, easy, do.